Peruvians, hello, weirdsiders. I welcome you. I get confused sometimes when I'm on nine different YouTube channels. It's no wonder I get confused. Um, and welcome back to the interviews. Woo! You're probably wondering, where have I been with these interviews? I'm amazing at this. Well, I've been over on the uh, weird side, and weird side. I've been over on the Taskmaster World interviewing people from New Zealand. Um, I, I, I somehow can't keep my feet grounded on the soil I walk on. But today we've got another wonderful interview. Not from New Zealand this time. See, I'm adventuring out. I've been to New Zealand. I've been to Sweden. Now I am in Australia, the, the home of some of the greatest panel shows as well. Taskmaster's not in Australia just yet, but Spix and Specs is. So, so you ah. still got that wonderful show that um, Adam Hills refused to mention anytime he's on anything. But <laughs> nevertheless, we also have some other wonderful things, things that you never expect you want to hear, but you do hear. Our guest, ah, ah, it's just me. I don't know why there's multiple, but my guests today are the hosts of a podcast that you'll not find anywhere else unless you're working on podcast platforms. Uh, escape this podcast, and hopefully we manage to escape this interview at the end. It's the wonderful Bill and Danny. Hello, hey, it's hey. us. Lovely to be here. I did not expect to hear good things about Australian panel shows from someone in the UK. That's amazing. Oh, I, I am a weird person. I, I, I am in college when, when, when it's break, I just play something that isn't English just to annoy them because I've got the subtitles <laughs> in front of me and, and I'm obsessed with Spix and Specs because that's fair yeah. because uh, it's, it's incredible um, it's hilarious and it's Adam Hills. But he, he does, he did a podcast once called Parenting Hell and he refused to mention the name Spix and Specs. <laughs> he said, oh, I'll run this music quiz show when he never mentioned it was called Spix and Specs. That's curious. Interesting. Um, but it is fantastic. At the risk of turning this interview that is about our show into a <laughs> Spix and Specs interview, it's just, it is really fantastic because the thing that was good about Spix and Specs is the level of comedy trivia. to earnestness and yeah the earnestness of the music it was in, it was actually quite intense musical trivia mm. that was still easy to watch without being like a silly dumbed down version of something for mm. a panel show that's just silly fun yeah it's just a very Did well balanced dance. show I, it's very rare to find something that's that intellectual yeah. but also that light it's very good yeah yeah and, and um... <laughs> what was the question again <laughs> sorry we're talking about <laughs> specs and specs now we'll, we'll get back on to the main point but to round off our Spix and Specs chat, yeah. if you want to watch Spix and Specs outside of the UK, I found out recently if you go to www.archive.org, ABC Australia uploaded it uh, themselves, and you can watch a two part episode with John Richardson in it where he gets surprised at modern TV. Oh, there we nice. go. <laughs> yes. Um, there you go. That's, that's trivia about Australia. Now we, we move on. We move on to why we're here. Uh, not to, to say how much we're like Adam Hills. Um, so you run, you two run the amazing podcast, Escape This Podcast. Um, first question, where did the name come from? I have been writing for oh, basically my entire life. I've always been story writing. And I think one thing that I have never done is come up with titles. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Look, it was one of those ones where we had the idea for the show. We thought we'll do escape rooms. We'll make them audio escape rooms. We'll have people come on and solve them. It's like a fun thing. Guests are coming on. They're playing a full escape room. Audience members are trying to play an escape room while listening. And I think I want to say that Escape This Podcast was a joke name at first because it was just like, hey, Escape This Podcast. And then it was one of those ones you say it and you yeah. think it's a silly throwaway joke. And then you say it again and you're like, actually, it has I kinda like it. all of the SEO you need, doesn't yes, it? Yes, you Google it, say, does this, you know, no one's done something similar. Actually, yeah, that's kind of, and eventually it just grows on you and you, and you hope it works. Um, and yeah, I think it has, it's been fun. And it's sort of expanded into the rest of our brand. We have spin off, we have a spin off show where we do murder mysteries called Solve This Murder. Uh, and it's just a fun sort of naming convention that works well for us. Well, um, if, if the podcast ever gets turned into a TV show, you can call it Escape This TV Show. 
pretty much. Exactly. It yeah. writes itself. All of our work is done That's, for us. This is what I like. You pick the Seinfeld method of coming up with names where it's just, yeah, just the something, just yeah. whatever. Just describe the thing. Don't be clever. Exactly. And then that is in itself clever. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it, We're it, above all that. Yeah, it's a brilliant name for the podcast. And that's my only downside to the way I work is I come up with these rubbish names and think of another name later and then realise Apple Podcast just doesn't want to update any of your, any of your stuff. And oh. you know, all over. It's, like, it's like annoying. So I changed my logo for one of my podcasts three times and it stayed with the original logo with, mm. the, with the wrong name. And then the worst is half of the services will update and the other half won't. Mm. And then you'd know, and then you'd just got different branding everywhere. We were very lucky to, to solidify Get that early one. on. Yeah. We made sure. Yeah. But now, now um, going, we're going to time travel back now to the origins of escape rooms. And we'll, and we'll start with, with Bill. How did you get into this crazy world of escape rooms? Well, Honestly, like, I feel like there's not really a separate story for us. I feel like you, be pretty went, close, yeah. you went to an escape room with your family, with mm-hmm. your with your mum and, and cousins. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was, oh, what, in 2016, 16? maybe? So it was fairly early on for escape rooms, especially like escape, escape rooms in Australia. You went to one of the first sort of rooms that was in Sydney. You loved it. And I think because we're both big video game nerds and role-playing game nerds and yeah. And we're, the idea of like, you could play this kind of like, like a point and click adventure thing, but in real life where you're moving things, and you're doing the puzzles. It sounded like a great idea. You went, luckily we went to a very, like, it was a good room. The, the people who ran the first rooms you we went to, it was a quality room. It made sense. It was fun. And so then we went together to do one of their other mm. rooms. Uh, and just from there, just started doing a whole bunch around the city. Uh, and I think that's a thing of escape rooms. Everybody goes to them really kind of, you're not sure of where, what it's exactly going to be because it's such an odd novel concept. And it, we were very lucky that the first ones we went to were good. They were good quality ones. And yeah. if you go to a bad one, you're like, oh, I get it. It's like a room that's poorly decorated with bad puzzles in it. I guess that's what all escape rooms are. <laughs> so luckily we went, oh, yeah. it's a narrative experience. It's got uh, fun, weird puzzles and great sets and you're locked in and sub rooms and all this other stuff and and weird things hidden everywhere. Great. This is what all escape rooms are. And we we loved it. And then from that point, we started making other escape room friends who could give us recommendations for the even more impressive ones mm-hmm. after that. So it just kept going up. We've never had to like skulk around and try for ourselves to find out which ones are good, which ones are bad. We always, we always have, have very good, good advice from yeah. knowledgeable people. Mm-hmm. Well, well, lucky for me, I actually live near two escape rooms. Nice. Uh, and, and, and Good ones? Yeah, well, well, I haven't been to the one that's really close to me, but the ones that's a little bit further than me I've been to, and, and they're very good. But um, I, I always think that escape rooms are, are interesting because not only can you go to an experience, you can also be in a room where you have to escape in real life. So when I was younger, I was trapped in a room and we had to try and escape <laughs> trying to escape the room um that was a poor joke that's not what <laughs> um no yeah it's it's very interesting going to a first escape room is such an experience it's really terrifying honestly when you don't know what you're going to be in for for it you i definitely if anyone hasn't been to one i recommend going with people at least one person who has been to one before mm. and can give you a bit of a lead into what to expect i spent my most of my first escape room there was a stack of newspapers in it and i was scouring them going one of these news stories has to be important yeah. No. Yeah, on one page of one newspaper, there were some circled letters to read, mm. but I just read the entire stack because I didn't know how deep the puzzles were going to go. And yeah, you know, I tried to find YouTube videos and things like that of people doing escape rooms, and there were only one or two out there, and they seemed really scary. They seemed frantic. They were all horror themed for some reason. And they just seemed like people were just running and screaming the entire time. I don't know if I saw a single puzzle. So quite frankly, I was terrified before going into my first one. And luckily my my mom was doing them and they were her experience before they were mine, which just, it feels all kinds of wrong, but (laughs) you know, what? I figured if this is her thing and she is enthusiastic about this, she's a wuss, I can do it. 
I, we took her on a roller coaster once and she came off and went <laughs> to us. Wow. She's yeah. not the thrill seeker of the family. Well, I, I do think escape rooms are interesting because um, when I think it was like a few years ago now, but because um, you can adapt escape rooms into anything, they did a Doctor Who one, which was Excellent. A, up my alley. And be not up my alley because one, I'm not very good at solving puzzles, and two, I have a knowledge <laughs> of Doctor Who. So, so one or two <laughs> things could work very well there. Um, we, we we managed to get out of the room, but I was normally just stood near somewhere, just looking at, just stroking a scarf in the corner. It mm. absolutely happens. Yeah. But it's also one of the things that's so nice about escape rooms is that even if you don't want to solve puzzles, even if you aren't into like working out exactly what's going to go in this lock and what the sequence yeah. of numbers is to press in here. There's still so much enjoyment, especially if you have other people in your group yeah. who like the puzzles. Yeah. There's so much enjoyment to get from uh, in, in a physical escape room, the, the sets and the, and the space that you're in and being in that space and kind of immersed in that area is just enjoyable. And in an audio version as well, like following along with the story and the, and, and it's like, I mean, it's the same as getting immersed in a book yeah. There's even without the puzzle aspect, just being in a space and existing and making decisions and seeing how things play out and and just even just watching a door open that opened in a cool way can be a satisfying use of an hour. Just be like, oh my god, there was a bookshelf and I pulled the fifth book and the door opened. It was amazing, like in the stories. And ideally, there will be a different variety of tasks that get to do that aren't all puzzle puzzles exactly. Mm -hmm. Like I remember one that we went to, the only one we've been to in London. There was a big puzzle that was connecting bits of pipe to one end of the room and then snaking them across the room to plug into the right spot at the other end of the room. I, I always say, I felt like I was on survivor while I was doing that. It wasn't a hard puzzle. It was connect this to that. I felt great. Yeah. And, and part of it is it was, I remember it because it was such a satisfying, it was like, you know, you take this big thing and it conks into yeah. this and, you know, and it's very visceral. You and feel very, powerful. It's, it's a nice feeling. I mean, we've had enjoyable times in an escape room hitting a small drum over and over again for <laughs> 20 minutes. But it was it was part of the room and it made sense and it was enjoyable. Yeah. And uh, you've got the people whose job it is to find certain things, the people just who have to keep things in order so that everything makes sense and you don't get lost. And you can always be valuable, even if the puzzle solving yeah. isn't necessarily something you're used to. So with, with escape rooms, you can have them on any franchise. So there's an, a Sherlock Holmes one. Now, mm -hmm. from the TV, so, so this is, this is probably going to alienate half the viewers. But if from if any Australian TV show that, that you don't know that if it's international, what TV show would you want to see as an escape room? What's your immediate first thought? My immediate first thought is Round the Twist. That was mine! <laughs> Round the Twist, I don't know if it made it to the UK. No, I'm assuming it, it didn't. It definitely did make it to the well, UK. Did. Because right. we now use it as our Sainsbury's advert theme tune. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, Round the Twist, right? It's a series of short stories that were written. Uh, I mean, it took all of its episodes from a series of short stories. It turned them into television episodes all centered around the same family living in a lighthouse. The lighthouse had ghosts. There was weird <laughs> stuff going on. The mayor was a bad guy just in a small coastal town in Australia. It would, it, all of the stories were weird, quirky, little supernatural things like one of the characters finding a hat that would make you copy what the person in front of you said. <laughs> it included things like the teenage boy having to give birth to a dryad baby in one it's, episode. Okay. It was it's a weird. weird show, weird show. But I think that's it's such why it's a great... got the potential and also a lighthouse setting. Yeah, a lighthouse is a fantastic place to do an escape room. It's built, you can picture the interior of a lighthouse, right? You've got the circular walls, you've got stuff everywhere. There's an upper level. Like it, You want to explore that space. It rewards exploring the space. And the, and the show would work so well at being able to take little tasks and tie each of them to one of these strange episodes mm. one of the strange things that happened you know you put in the ghosts and and it would be either fan service for people who know it or just a fun series of like narratively justified weird things to do in a room i think it would work very well mm. we haven't given any thought to this before but it is clearly apparently, apparently. the yeah. right answer no one's doing a sea change escape room i wish i'd watched it maybe i could have been no great. one's doing a uh, 
uh, oh my god, what are some other weird Australian shows? Jeopardy, but not the quiz not show. Not that the Jeopardy. One, the one oh, where no, a bunch of kids. Jeopardy, yeah. yeah. That was actually a UK show. I think. Was it? I don't remember. Well, there was a program called Jeopardy, and it wasn't a quiz show. It was some weird program that that everyone just blocks from the red because they don't <laughs> want to remember it. Um, they've still got it on the CBC website, so I don't know it because fifty percent of British TV these days is Australian. Yeah, that's true. So, so you can turn it on and you're watching an Australian program. And each episode, it's a, I, th- I can't remember what it's called, but it's a football program where it's about the girls' football team. But they can't make the mind up whether it's soccer or football. So in each team, like, oh. let's go and play soccer. No, let's go and play football. I, I'm on the girls' football team. No, no, I'm on the boys' soccer team. And they can't make the yeah. mind up. Three seasons. I do- I do grant you that is pretty true to the Australian yeah, that's experience. An, that's an Australian experience around. You'll that find sport. some people who are definitely soccer and some who are definitely football, and never the twain shall meet. Yeah, exactly. And then you watch them do interviews, and it's even worse because it's <laughs> like line, and one's like, "Oh yeah, I, I used to play football," and then the other one's like, "I've never played soccer before," and did the program, mm. and then the presenter then couldn't work out, and then the presenter just well, like she got confused. Yeah. Yeah. All That'll Australian nice. sports you have to just pick up from context about what anyone's talking about. Even football. Like that can it could be, be four soccer. different sports. If you're in Victoria, it's definitely AFL. If you're in New South Wales or Queensland, it's definitely rugby. But maybe, or who knows which rugby? Maybe they're talking about union. Maybe they're talking about league. No one knows. We just say whatever we want. You assume it's a sport. Now, um, now I I have I have an answer to this question. Now, nowhere boys. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I don't know if it was. Past. You watched that one, didn't you? No, Nowhere, Boys. Nowhere Boys. Nowhere Boys was uh, the program that was about uh, this magic where all the parents had forgotten who the children were and the children were in a parallel universe. I've and definitely it, heard of it and seen the ads for it. I thought you watched that. I have not. I'm sorry. Series one to three aired uh, in like 2015 and, and 20, no, 2013 and 15. And then in 2021, they then decided to wear the final series after all the after everyone had probably found it illegally. Um, but it would work as an escape room because it's like it's like a, a world where these kids have got magic and then they've transported to another world where they've no one knows them and they get back to their other world and then they've got magic and then and then they have to work out how to work life mm. with this magic and then they have like zombies and, <laughs> and they have alien versions of the friends and then they have like people that want to zap powers off them. So Excellent. I reckon, I reckon that would work because they've got like this like like necklace sort of crystal thing that breaks in half. And so and so one ah. of the, their puzzles within the show is trying to piece it together to get it to light up. Yeah, okay. that sounds like it fits right in. Magic is always an interesting one to try to incorporate yeah. into escape rooms just based on the fact that the satisfaction for a lot of puzzles is connecting things together and making sure connections make sense and for magic that can be a really fine line to draw because mm. a lot of magic inherently doesn't make sense you yeah. click your fingers and something happens yes. over there and yeah. you have to just make sure that it bounces I, well it absolutely can and, I and that sounds really thing, promising the best thing to do with magic in an escape room is ensuring that you have very clear rules yeah so mad the usage of magic is almost like solving a little puzzle it's like you can only do these sorts of spells when you have these ingredients or these sorts of things and here's the effects it will have and honestly it's things like that as well that can work a little bit better i think in virtual escape rooms or audio escape rooms oh yeah you're not confined to real world physics and like the ability to 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 describe yourself like oh i'm gonna walk in i'm gonna say the magic words i'm gonna throw my hands over the air and and do this this weird cool thing is much easier to describe than it is to do yourself knowing there's a person watching you on camera (laughs) as you stand in the middle of the escape room hoping you're flailing your arms correctly and you feel very embarrassed yeah been there yeah Yeah. exactly you know and so you want to uh some things can you, you got to think about the experience of doing it you know and magic can be tough um yeah but i think maybe a bit easier in audio it can can be. I tell you what i know we should again i'm sure we should move on but there was one show and i can't remember the name of it when, when we were kids which was a live action tv show that was a sci-fi show in which effectively it was about kids oh, it was about like a whole fleet of people on like a colony ship like this ship is okay. going to sail tw- in, into you know into a planet 200 light years away and we're traveling so we keep like unfreezing enough kids to be the crew for like seven years and then they go back into oh, hibernation and we unfreeze grim. more kids and it was just about kids on a ship that was just going for it and i have no idea if anyone in 
if there are people in the YouTube comments who know what I'm talking about, please comment. That's it was some familiar. weird. It was some weird show. Nothing. And yeah, and it was just, I believe it was an Australian show. And it was just kids on a ship, piloting the ship that was going, it was going to go, they were going to get frozen eventually and then wake up on the future planet that they were on. It was like, oh, it was like Silver Sun or something. I have no idea. It's something like this. That you could do an escape room of. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone knows the answer, because I feel like I, I sort of recollect it, but I'm a weird child that knows too much about TV, not just from my own country. Mm. Or, yeah, if you know in the in the comments uh comment and if you don't Apparently know just it comment is a gonna fake be name. important to bill yeah and yeah, let me and I'll, I'll have a look and we'll see yeah. well now that we've learned how much you love uh, escape rooms this this will then um sort of make it much clearer and then where did this love turn into a passion project of a audio podcast podcast that has the best logo i've ever seen <laughs> it's a good logo yeah thank you very much to greg for designing that yeah a friend of ours designed the logo and we were just he, he was a he was a freelance logo designer part-time when he did it um which he does not do anymore and it was it was just fantastic we were so impressed by it we'll give him a um, round of applause yeah everyone awesome. clap, clap, for, clap for greg everybody <laughs> anyway how this turned into our podcast bill had been saying for a probably a couple of years at that point since discovering what podcasts were that he wanted to do one of those things. And I went, yeah, we totally should. Let me know when you've got a good idea because I don't want to sit there reading Wikipedia pages. <laughs> and we just didn't do anything for a, a very long time until 2016 when we'd done a couple of escape rooms, probably no more than half a dozen of them. And then just sort of looked and went, do you reckon those two things go together? Mm -hmm. And even, even then we had sat and spent a day deciding, let's try and think this through. And we sat, we spent an entire day uh, trying to brainstorm what you could do a podcast about. What, mm -hmm. what Only one day? We were, we, well, we, we were thinking about it for ages, but we spent a day, we sat down. Uh, and I think Greg may have been part of that as well. Really? Originally, I believe ah, he was there for that. That's nice. Um, and uh, I mean, if I say any more, he'll ask her for some money. Uh, but <laughs> we were all sitting together and, and we were just going and going and just talking and talking and trying to figure out what you could do a show about, what would be fun, what do we know? You know, This podcasts... was the big problem that I always felt I wasn't an authority enough on anything mm. to do a nonfiction podcast, yeah. which was a lot of the podcasts that I knew about at the time were experts in topics talking about mm. them. And I was not an expert in any topic. And then there were, you know, there's also just the, oh, we'll just kind of chat about whatever. And it's like, well, I don't know if we want to do that. Do we want to make something that has like a proper structure kind of artistic or like an artistic integrity to it? I suppose like it's a, re like it's a real thing. It isn't just sort of us stick in a mic which you know is a very viable thing for a lot of people to do because a lot of people are very very fun to be a fly on their wall but we just wanted to make something that felt like I think for me I needed more of a creative outlet which I didn't That's have at fair. the time and we sat and we thought we thought and eventually we got to hey escape rooms are fun maybe that could work and I think we we did a little uh, impromptu test of the idea it was just like make up an escape room right now let's like just start describing a room I'll start describing what I do um, because we'd played uh, tabletop role-playing games, kind of Dungeons and Dragons style yeah. games. And, we, and we'd been, I'd been doing that for years. I mean, so would you, right? Yeah, Billy introduced that to me when we were teenagers. Uh, and so we thought, oh, I wonder if you could make that type of content, but for escape rooms. We gave it a, a like a five-minute play test of pure improvised nonsense and went, this is actually very fun to listen to. Um, I can imagine sitting at home and saying, you idiots, what are you doing? Press the green button. Well, I figured it out 10 minutes ago. Why are these, these people are so dumb? Uh, and I just thought that's a fun feeling for an audience member to have. And yeah. you can get that with escape rooms. You always like that moment on a quiz show where you know the answer and nobody else does. So yeah. this just felt yeah. like it was yeah. going to be an extended version that. of that. Um, and of course, we had also at that point uh, seen Janet Varney's YouTube show. I believe we had at that point. I think probably. Which kind of gave this idea of the... Um, the ability to present escape rooms to people who aren't playing them. Yeah. So there was a YouTube series uh, that Geek and Sundry did, hosted by Janet Varney, called, I think, just, just Escape. Escape with Janet Varney. Um, and it was similar. It was filmed content of, of celebrities doing escape rooms 
that they had fully built up and fully mocked up and and done all that sort of stuff. And and that was an enjoyable show for us. It kind of showed that there was a viability in enjoying escape rooms when you're not the person in them. And so then we had to try and think about how to replicate that in an audio medium, uh, which, hey, a lot less overhead in the audio medium. (laughs) Yeah. I don't have, we we haven't had to build any sets at all. We just say, imagine a pirate ship. And that's the same amount of effort as, or the same effect as building a pirate ship. It's great. Yeah, Yeah, we got off really easy. Wow. So, so, um, (laughs) so it, it, so another, another comparison you can make for escape rooms, which I just thought of is Crystal Maze. Mm, mm, a a, classic version of that same idea. Yeah. Yeah. And and that, that is like, I do, when I first listened to it and I, and half the things that I'm into, I don't remember how I got into them, but I'll um, I'll probably make up a story here. Um, but I think I think the first episode I heard was Alex Horn, Ed Gamble, and Rose Matafeo, mm. uh, and because I think someone online had must have shared it and went, "Look, Alex is in this," and I listened to it, and it was incredible. Uh, one because I never expecting Alex to be into escape rooms and second of all mm. Alex I hadn't met Alex at that point um I've now met Alex since and me and Alex are like best friends I won't, I won't go that far but <laughs> oh we're yeah friends. Nah, no. yeah yeah we're, that's we're, all we're, we we're acquaintances um <laughs> uh, and and so and so it, it was an interesting format now my question uh, is probably probably going to be a very complicated answer but how did you manage to get hold of the celebrity you've had, I'll name a few others. Uh, you've also had uh, Paul Williams, uh, who I've also met, and you've had Guy Montgomery, I think, or was it yep. William? Mm-hmm. Uh, similar people. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to interview both of them, but if they're listening or watching. But how did you manage to get hold of them and explain to them the concept of of the of the medium? Well, you do all the talking to people. How do you explain to them what we do? Well, I would say there, there was definitely a, a ramp up in our guest list kind of, I don't want to say caliber, because that implies that our friends were lower caliber, but in terms of their, <laughs> how, the fur, getting further out from us, yeah. right? So in our original season, all of our guests were family, were friends, were people that we knew in person. And we recorded pretty much that entire season in person. Um, with one, uh, our first guests were on our 10th episode and they were other escape room podcasters. So for that, that was quite easy to get them obviously across. And right? yet it felt super intimidating at the time. Oh, I was terrified. Yeah, for us, this was our sort of like step into, oh, we're part of the escape room community. Yeah. Like we could become known uh, people in that industry, in that community. Uh, and that was our first sort of first step towards that sort of stuff. Uh, and at first it's easy, right? Friends will do something because you just tell them to, right? They don't need to understand the concept. You're just like, hey, you're a friend. Come here. Come and do this thing that we're doing. And, and they'll do it because they support you. And that's why they're your friend. And I think from there, we sort of moved up into other indie podcasters, people who were like us, desperately trying to build an audience. And they wanted to interact. We wanted yeah. to talk. And we met a, a bunch of lovely friends through that. And um, and for them, really, the thing that works so well for us in terms of getting guests on the show is that we don't need to say to guests, like, would you like to come on? You have to kind of prep this, or we're going to talk about this, or what are your opinions about X, Y, Z, or could you like come on? We're going to ask you the hard hitting questions. And so there's no feeling for our guests that like, this is going to be a job for them, or this is going to be a a thing they've had to do, uh, you know, for the nth time, or this is going to be work, or they're going to have to think. We say to them, hey, you want to play a game? game? Yeah, do you want to play a game? Would you like to play a game? It's very simple. If you know escape rooms, and generally we try and err on the side of getting guests who do know escape rooms. Yeah, right, sometimes, yeah. sometimes we don't. Yeah. Um, but, you know, say, do you want to play this sort of a game? You, we, you, we'll, we'll talk you through it. You just need to turn up and, and do something fun. Uh, and I think because of that, there's, there's, it's easier to get over that hump of yeah. people agreeing to it. Because you say, no effort, no pre-prep, come play a fun game, which you would usually like pay someone to run for you. Come and play a game. Um, but part of what works for it is, you know, we were getting uh, indie podcasters and then other sort of more prominent podcasters and, and people in the escape room industry as well. Uh, well, one of the things that, that helps is when you have had guests that have some kind of kind of cachet to their name, some kind of clout to them, where you can say, look, we've come play a game. We've had people on such as X, Y, Z. And then they go, oh, you know, Oh, like you, you, you say to Paul Williams, would you like to come on the show? 
we I don't did we get Paul before Alex or no, after Alex, Alex was right? first. So yeah. we had Alex Horn on the show I, I, because Alex Horn is is yeah. very very lovely. He's very open to to people kind of getting in touch and saying hi. And and we thought about you know, hey Alex, it'll be great to have you on because. You Clearly seem you like, like a puzzles. puzzly minded you know, person. You'll, you'll enjoy this. Oh, we oh, were yeah. surprised that he wasn't a big escape room yeah, we enthusiast before. He's practically designed them in Taskmaster. You know, he's he's that uh, the whole challenge with the key in his hand and the and you have to run around and find all the clues and yeah, follow them. I thought it must be that he loves right escape rooms. Yeah. You know? And yeah. the fact that he hadn't really done them, I was like, oh, that's wild. Uh, but then you know, when you get Paul Williams on, you can say, look, we've had Alex Horn on. You're New Zealand's Alex Horn now, would you like to come on? And he goes, oh, great. Like, that's a clear thing that lets me know this is a legitimate yeah. project. Yeah. And then they can come on and, and have fun with that. One of the first things that helped out, I think, with that was we had Neil Patrick Harris on the show. Wow. Um, <laughs> I've not heard this one. This is news to me. <laughs> I've heard all of them. Wow. <laughs> I can get on that. Um, but yeah, so, so he came on the show. Um, and that's because he is, uh, and w- we had him on as, uh, like on our list of possible like great guests like wouldn't it be amazing if we could get him on the show because we knew he was a magician he loved puzzles he wrote a choose your own adventure audio uh, autobiography like we knew that he was in this world of puzzles and games and things like that so we knew he would enjoy it yeah um what we didn't expect was he was so deep in the world of puzzles <laughs> and games that he actually found our show before we ever reached out to him wow. and he reached out to us and said i'd love to be on the show so wow. that was an easy one to organize uh, but at that point, you know, it, it that was amazing. sort of the, 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 the more and more you get guests like that, the more it legitimizes your guest list. So you can reach out to other people and say, look, we've had these types of these kind of people and yeah. these we've had, uh, you know, podcasters, and we've had actors, and we've had this and the other, we've had designers. Would you like to join that thing? And the, the more in alluring that is, the more like, oh, look at this, <laughs> look at this wonderful company you could be part of, the more they think, oh, okay, let me just take a second to check it out. Or maybe I'll be receptive to this. And then you say, if you like escape rooms, it's like a free, you're going to play a free escape room. We're going to put some microphones in it so we can listen. To, but, an, ex- to an extent, like with Twitter as an existent thing that everyone's Twitter's, on, right. being able to reach out to people is shockingly easy nowadays. Mm. And, you know, sometimes if you just manage to find the right people who are community- communicative, yeah, like me, um, <laughs> And who just, I don't know, you get them in the right mood for playing a game. They say yes. And it just feels nice and natural and like a good conversational thing that could have happened anywhere. Like that was how one of the first really big, exciting ones to me was getting Jason Ritter. Mm, Yeah. And Jason was lovely because Jason Ritter was just kind of uh, responsive on Twitter to the idea. It Mm -hmm. was just a cold sort of message to say, hey, would you like to come and do this? We, you know, we're very big fans of yours. We know uh, that you like escape rooms because we had seen him on Janet Varney's escape yeah. with Janet Varney. And we thought, would you like to come on? And he was very lovely. He's an incredibly friendly person. And he agreed. And, and we, uh, we had him on and, and it was fantastic. We had him on twice, both times, incredibly enjoyable. And uh, yeah, the more you get people on, yeah, the more the easier it becomes. Um, and also, yeah, it's just fun to get people want to play a fun game. Yeah. I think. Right, they they almost don't even need to think about the fact that it's a podcast because like don't even worry about performing, just solve some puzzles, and you'll just be naturally charismatic. And I think that that's helpful. Yeah, and and when you were saying about once you get like bit like sort of ish big names and then more people join, I think I think that's how uh, I've managed to last this long, because um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's surprising because I in twenty twenty I interviewed a, a very small YouTuber and then. The first ever, and my second ever interview with Alex Horn because we had email, we had emailed him, then twittered him, and I, I think I must have sent him the same message many times because mm. he sent me a direct message, just just read done, and <laughs> I've no idea what it was because obviously by that point my my memory had been faded of what I had <laughs> done to sort of do this, but then I ended up interviewing him, and then last year it was twenty three people, and um, and there were a mixture of. Oh, some YouTubers that I I uh, ish knew, and then a lot of them like people that were from my childhood that I was watching on TV. Mm. I actually met, and then and then it all went weird by the by the time I interviewed the Swedish Taskmaster, and then <laughs> and then met Paul William, and then met a lot of contestants, and met the book that helped Paul write the tasks for New Zealand. Ugh. He reached mm. out to me in my YouTube comment section, 
and then it just like you, your list gets bigger and then that helps <laughs> you so then when I when I say I want to interview let's say for instance Bear Grylls I've got an arsenal of people that I can select or if I interview someone and I know they're friends with people I've mm. interviewed, you then link them to those and you say, mm. well, I've interviewed those people. How about you? Ooh. And, 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 and it is absolutely. It's a legitimate kind of feeling in the same way, especially if they're already friends. Like I would go and do something if, if we talked about Greg designed our logo, if he said, oh, hey, I know this person who's doing this, you should go do it. I would, I would do it. Right. I, that's a person that I have a, uh, it immediately gives it a real connection to me in my life. If yeah. rather than if the person that Greg knew came up to me and said, "Hey, do this for me," I'd be like, "I don't know who you are. What, what's going on?" I'd probably still do it. I'm a nice guy, but <laughs> you know, it immediately attaches it to something real in your life. And no, other people that people are that they're friends with, or that they're fans of, yeah. or that they, you know, even if just someone they've heard of, immediately makes you go from a random person reaching out to, "Oh." I have a connection point to you in my life. So now you're a real human and I would like to interact with you. And it does, it makes a big difference. Yeah. And, and, and it's it, just hard to start getting those steps up yeah. and you just got to, uh, and, and, and part of it is some people are open enough and friendly enough. Alex Horn is a great example. Jason yeah. Ritter was a great example. I'm saying all this, please, if, if everybody starts messaging them, uh, don't tell them that I, I said it. <laughs> uh, I don't want them to get mad at me. But well, you know, some people- Maybe they don't do that anymore. Maybe they're tired yeah, now. Exactly. Yeah, But some people are willing to take that risk or take yeah. that chance or just be open to, to that experience. And once they are, that opens up yeah. more things yeah. for you and more, more uh, ability to, to, to ask more people. Um, yeah. But yeah, you just got to find those things. And you just, and a lot of it is you send out 200 cold emails or Ooh. 200 cold tweets. And one person says, yeah, that's cool. And you go, great. Now I've done that one. And it's just that little step up. Yeah. And from there it gets easier and easier. Yeah, and and because you've had Alex on and Paul Williams on, and um, mm. I, I I don't know the extent to to this fact, but I had read in an article that um that Ollie, the Norwegian version of Alex, um, who who was vidis who visit a Taskmaster series fifteen recordings early this week. I just saw that. Mm. Yeah, um, and and I don't know why I mentioned him because I meant David. I'm getting confused with people now. David comes in. <laughs> who is the Swedish version of Alex and Paul mm. Williams and Alex themselves. And I don't know if the others are involved, but they're in their own WhatsApp group chat. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and, nice. and so they chat to each other and he goes, oh, I've just got this really good task. And then they share it between each other. And, and I don't know if Paul and Alex are creating their own Escape This podcast group chat, but I think that would be <laughs> hilarious if they went, oh, I did this and you love this. And that would just be hilarious. Yeah, we're going to watch out to see if any of our puzzles appear in future seasons of Taskmaster. Would now. you not be thrilled? Thrilled for the money I'm going to ask for. <laughs> yeah. Thrilled for the royal, the task oh, royalties. Yeah. <laughs> there are some things you can only dream of. And I think having the Alex Horn, Paul Williams private WhatsApp chat about yourselves. Yeah, that's, that's what you that's want. That's one of them. That's the that dream, would, I think. That would be brilliant. <laughs> And really, and over the years of, of, of podcasts and all this, and Ed Gamble speaking on it, he is in a he is in an escape room team with Rose mm. and Paul, um, mm. and and it, and it's really in, interesting. Now, with um, you you said you had another podcast called Solve This Murder. Um, how come you didn't call it Escape This Murder? Because I thought <laughs> would, would that not sound like you'd be murdered and you have to run away? <laughs> Well, true. See, but it's one of these things, right? Like, escape this murder. Well, that's just now. Now we're just back to escape rooms, and we're doing all puzzles in escape rooms again, right? And now nobody's being murdered. Yeah, if you escape from the murder, fun no, in that, nothing happened. Uh, yeah. No. But yeah, that one was very much just hearkening to. We like Agatha Christie books. Mm. We like whodunits. So yeah. straight up, solve this murder. That's what you're doing. Wow. Yeah, there's no trickery to it. It just so happens to be another something this something mm. that exactly describes what's happening no well, fuss about it well i get the christie's my favorite author of all time excellent uh, and uh i've seen nearly all of the programs that she's made i refuse to watch the itv version of miss marple because the bbc <laughs> version is far better um <laughs> no one can argue with that and then hugh Laurie made a new version a new um mm. one for brit box called why ask evan Oh, uh, yeah, why didn't they ask Evans? Yeah, I just heard about that. I'm yeah. very excited. I'd love yeah. to see it. And and it, it's supposed to be good. Um, yeah. Uh, 
And so go, going back to escape rooms and not escaping to into um Shulori and Agatha Christie because we'd be there all day. Oh, um, they're all we can heavily relate all of them for yeah. a very long time. I can tell just... you there's probably about like 30 Agatha Christie books directly above the screen right now that I can look wow. at. I could we could just oh what's what are we what are we gonna grab? What's uh, I keep reaching for oh. not the best ones. Oh look, here's murder from Mesopotamia. Ooh, murder Ooh. from Mesopotamia. Ooh. <laughs> all right, we're done. Yeah. Um and, and Agatha Christie has an audio uh, autobiography on Audible in her voice. So it's Oh, what? Voice. Yeah, so I felt that, and we're going way off track, but I had to mention it. <laughs> Worth so, it. I had, because I love Strap Audible. in, YouTube. <laughs> I loved uh, Audible um, because it's like you read the books and you're like, oh, yeah, it's a good book, but then you listen to it and it's like a whole new world. Um, sure. Especially with comedians because they like add bits and like Adam Hills did all the accents from the new, <laughs> that he wrote in the book. On Audible, you, you can't be an Agatha Christie, and it comes up with this autobiography that she read some of it and other people read others but it's like saved recordings so it's like the old oh. recordings of her from the 40s reading this. that's beautiful yeah and it just sounds incredible does her yeah. voice sound the way you expect it to hello uh, i'm agatha christie <laughs> oh i'm solving all these crimes i do i love it when they solve crimes yeah poirot is my favorite one i'm agatha christie i am is that is that about it is that what you expected that's how I read no, them all. No, she, she sounds really shy and quiet. Aww. I, when I was a child, I was a child, and I grew up. Yay! Uh, yeah, and and yeah, and it's and it's really interesting. And so back to what we were supposed to be talking about now, with um the the introduction of having um so celebrity ish people because a celebrity like. Hollywood stars, but Alex Orn is like a, a British celebrity in his own right that not many people know. Uh, who who would you want to have on? Because my list is longer than my arm and it probably rolls into yeah. Australia is that long. Goodness. See, I don't know. A lot of the times, right, because there's lots of people who are like, you know, big celebrities, huge celebrities, but I think part of what's interesting about our show is it is a specific type of game and what's good to make a good episode you want people on who are who you know will be good for it right who who understand sort of this world and enjoy solving puzzles and doing this sorts of thing right so like you know you could say like oh wouldn't it be great to get tom hanks on the show maybe but i don't actually know i have, know not, I have no tom evidence hanks if tom hanks show. would be into this sort of right? thing so you might get someone phenomenal and and then sort of sit there and be like oh okay this is not a good episode. I'm enjoying talking to someone who I respect and think is fantastic, but I'm making bad media right now. Yeah. So, so part of our, our guest list is people who overlap into the spheres of, of kind of the right type of nerdiness, right? So I think there, and, and for a lot of the case, a lot of the people that we want to get on the show that we would really love to have as guests are larger podcasters that, we listened to that inspired us and luckily at this point we're sort of ticking them all off yeah. right we're, we're going oh we got <laughs> you know you want the McElroy family we'll get the McElroy family you want good job brain we'll get good job brain yeah. and so that's it's been, been really lovely that's been very very lovely for us we get to get people who we who are kind of our uh, our podcasting heroes to to come on the show and, and play through them it could be like there's lots of fun stuff to think about but I think I just don't know who's like a, a super, super A-lister that you would think, oh, they'd be great. Ryan Reynolds would probably be good. I don't think Ryan I Reynolds think could he, produce a poor episode. Surely he would be into this I think he'd be the right type of uh, nerd to be into. Yeah, yeah right? he gives off that feel for sure. Ryan, if you're listening, come join us. Come play a game with us. Um, Taika Waititi, I think, would be also be another good one. Ooh. He would be really oh, I haven't favorite. thought about him. I think, well, see, there's part of me that worries. There are certain people, I think Taika Waititi is one, and uh, I think um, uh, now I'm going crazy. Uh, Richard Ayoade is another <laughs> where you'd be sort of worried. You get him on the show and they'd just be like, 
I'm going to break this show down and then not <laughs> and refuse to engage. I'm going to figure I out the level. I don't play your game. Yeah. I have my game. I'm going to take what you're doing. I'm going to con- deconstruct it and then deliberately not put it back together again. I'm going to throw the pieces off and the it'll board. It'll be hilarious. It'll be, a, it'll be great but... fun, but I don't know if we'll get to the end of it. And there are Australian um, uh, celebrities as well like that. Like I've always thought um, I've, I've been a longtime fan of the Australian sketch group Auntie Donna. Oh, They're yeah. They're fantastic, they are, they are wonderful, but also uh, notorious for destroying every interview that they've ever done and just <laughs> absolutely demolishing it, taking yeah. apart and being in character and deliberately going exactly up. And, and it's great. It's very fun to listen to, but I've always thought, I don't know if I want to we, reach out to them. We do not make complimentary sorts of media in that game. way. I think they're phenomenal. I don't know if they would. Ig- I think if you got any of them individually, they'd, they'd be great. They'd be incredibly smart. They'd figure out, they'd play, they'd be charismatic. But if you got all three of them together, they would just- That's a like, comedy troupe Sorry, now. Sorry, we're Auntie Donna. We're going to break this. <laughs> so it's an interesting balance to find. I think Taika Waititi could be phenomenal. Or oh. He might ruin it. He might break it. He might destroy everything. Uh, so you never know. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, still, I still think the, uh, the one person that we definitely need to make sure we get me? on at some point- Is it me? Victoria Corrin Mitchell. Oh, Victoria Corrin Mitchell. Oh, would be that would be brilliant because her- Love to get Victoria- she did a brand new program called Reaction Brain, where Richard Hammond, of all people, is hosting the <laughs> panel show, and she's a team captain. It's all about science, and she uses her brain to work out whether a man, a blacksmith, would smash a diamond with his hammer, <laughs> or a rugby player would not get wet if his house was on fire and there was a door in his way. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> and last I heard when uh, I was on Ed Gamble's Taskmaster podcast, she had not done any escape rooms, but was interested in them. Well, then we and I think our show is a good place to fit in there. Yeah, so watch. Ryan Reynolds, if you're listening, could you ask Victoria Corrin Mitchell to come on our show? <laughs> Don't think Ryan Reynolds knows Victoria. Ryan Reynolds listens to every interview show on YouTube. He's got to keep uh, up with what's happening in the world. He, he's the only source him. of news. Well, but Paul Williams um, told, told me this hilarious tale how when, when they were filming the What Do We Do in the Shadows film, because it was filmed in Wellington, he had just mm. happened to be there every time they were recording. So he had to send a tweet to him saying, I'm sorry if it looks like I'm stalking you. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole, there was, he, was in, he was in the film, Paul Williams, but they deleted what? the scene. They removed the scene oh. from the film, but he was in it because it was by accident. So he was in that pub just, just having happened a to be there. <laughs> they're not they're not doing anything to help their reputation of being small with only 20 people living there, are they? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, everybody's in the film, right? Um yeah. Yeah. And and I, I think um Adam Hills would be good at mm. going yes. back to our obsession of, of Spicks and Specs. Of course. And I'll tell you what, I'll make him talk about Spicks and Specs. Yeah. I'll make him say yeah. it. I gotta say, Alan, say Alan Bro Myth Wars, I think they would be fantastic as well. I the think whole, the, the they whole all have good energy for this. Trio yeah. would be perfect. I think they yeah, right. Um yeah. No, Adam Hills would be fantastic. Um you, you would there's be. lots of whenever you start to think about it, this yeah. you just find more and more but there's a particular energy, like that's it. That's like that's the right guest energy uh, for, for our sort of show. So once you see it in someone, you just sort of mentally add them to the list and you think, all right, great. I'm going to, I'll, maybe I'll message them. Maybe I'll email them. I have one country, uh, one country. I have one question for you about countries. Okay. Do you in particular have any, like if we were just curating a shiny new guest list and we got to have everyone on it, any country that you would focus on guests from? Because I, I just still feel like we have shockingly few Australians. We do have shockingly show. few Australians. We, I'd love to have a bigger kind of uh, presence in the Australian media yeah. market. I'd mm. love to get Hamish and Andy on would be mm. fantastic guests. Lots of these sort of Australian celebrities would be. And we've, I mean, we've had a few. Um, oh, yeah, not none. We had Mark sure, Humphreys on. But... I'd love to have gotten Mark Fennell on. We yeah. almost did. We were in kind of talking. And uh, But, yeah, I think that would be lovely to do. I, do you know what would be maybe fun? I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Nigeria. Interesting. I don't know. There's like, it's a big kind of, I don't know any, you know, people from Nigeria. It's a good step into the African market. That's true. We haven't gone there so much. No idea. <laughs> it's just off the top of my head. Interesting. You can get the cast of Call My Agent Bollywood to be on it. You can get the cast of Call My Agent Bollywood to be on it. Yeah. That's awesome. You see, they'll just keep trying to call their agent to get him out of the room. <laughs> Some kind of Russell Howe. Uh, 
I knew, I knew there would be a reference there at some point. I knew someone <laughs> would make the reference. But um, there's there's one thing we're, we're going way off track here. But um, if so, so Adam Hills, right? It's amazing. But do you reckon Adam would be a good taskmaster for Taskmaster Australia? Oh boy, we discuss this so much, and most of the time we just end up saying let's just not do it in Australia. We'd probably ruin it. Uh, But yeah, we have these conversations about who the Australian taskmaster should be all the time. I don't think Adam has enough in him to just say, not one point. That's that's very hard to picture him doing. I've always maintained that my, my pick would be Hannah Gadsby. I think would be a great Australian taskmaster. I think Sean McAuliffe could do a pretty solid job. Sean McAuliffe would go a bit too weird about it. He's a little bit too absurd, I think. To, to, to like, he, he, you know, he, he wouldn't give things one point. He'd just be like, I'm going to give everybody no points, but you can have a blue duck. That's the point for you. See you later. I'm Sean McHale. He'd just do something a bit too weird. Interesting. Wow. I, he, yeah. You, you got to find someone who's got the right balance of, are they going to have the nice energy, the funny energy and the mean energy? And it's very hard to pull off. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and we don't want another situation where, where they have to call in Greg to yell at the taskmaster. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did it in the New Zealand version. That was pretty solid. Yeah, that, that was that's like the best way to cross over the shows. Just just have <laughs> Greg just yelling at someone. All right, and so with um the the podcast and with it being a with with a lot of podcasts now, especially British ones, now becoming the type of podcast that have it is popular and then go on tour and then create books or or in the case of of uh, Chris Ramsey and his wife uh, make it into a TV show. What's your end goal for this behemoth of a show, if that's the correct word? I probably didn't do it right. <laughs> yeah, people have started asking us what our l- long-term plans. See, I don't know. I think there's one of these things that, like, you know, sometimes there are people who write books and you know they're only writing the book because they really want someone to make a movie of their book, but they just don't, they can't make a movie. <laughs> You know, or like I, I love the 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 way we make our show, and what it is. Like I don't think for me there's like it's not a stepping stone. It, yeah, I can't. I really don't picture it as like a even like going on tour doing live show versions of it or doing like, like making a TV show of it. You made a TV show of it. It's like it's a very different experience. And there's something to me that's as in podcasting in general. There's something really beautiful about this immediacy of just it's one person or two people or a few people, and you just you produce this thing, it exists as an as you know, an update to an RSS feed. It goes out, everybody interacts. I, I I love the way we make our show and I love what it is. And I think sometimes when you talk about like what's the long-term plan, long-term plan is to make the same show and have two million people listen to it. That's what I'd like. <laughs> you know, and that makes me more money. <laughs> but I don't want to change, like I love the way we produce this. And I think long-term plans can be other projects, right? Making new things. But I think it's important to make your media for the medium that it's in, right? You make your show to be exactly what it is. And I think our show is designed fundamentally from the ground up to be a a, a small, made by two people. Maybe you get one editor at some point and it goes straight out and it is what it is. And I, and I really like, I like that it's a game that people can download and play themselves. I like that people yeah. can get all of Danny's notes, play it at home and do all that. And, and, you know, you think we could turn what we do into, I think the closest I would get is try and automate the idea of playing. it. I think we could take our escape this podcast idea and have people be able to interact with the show yeah as like they're playing a game, right? To, yeah. to be able to get the notes and rather than have to have someone run it, have a game or an app where Danny's script is interacting with them as a player, typing in like mm-hmm. a text-based adventure, choosing, clicking, yeah. integrating it like that, I could see work because it is a game as much as it is a show. No. But if we made a TV show about escape rooms, I don't think it would be Escape This Podcast. I don't think no. it would be Escape with Janet Barney. I think it would be something different. Made you want to escape with Janet Barney again once you've mm. escaped with the ones you've done, but you could call it Escape This App. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're, we've got a naming convention now. We're, we're sticking with it. it doesn't, we escape. don't have to worry. You have to trademark it, the word escape. So then you. <laughs> I, have, 
I don't know if we can justify that trademark. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now going into more of the um, technical side. So, if anyone wants to know how to make um, an escape room uh, for audio listeners, um, uh, and just before we go on to that, the uh, side question would be: Now, Spotify has done um, allowed you to do videos. I would you ever reach into that medium of of uh, doing a video side for the Spotify listeners? Video, I think that I have two reasons that I wouldn't be crazy about that. One is that that seems way harder to edit for oh, you. Oh, it'd be way harder to edit. And you. the other reason is uh, we've done a couple of live shows and even on our podcast, we often do the recordings with video between me and the players. And uh, my face gives away everything. <laughs> everything if we do too many videos i'm sure you will eventually see me mouthing the codes <laughs> so it might not be the best idea um and it is one of those things as well i think podcasts that transition to video they again right when you talk about making something for the medium you're making it in once you move to a video version of the podcast you should fundamentally be exploiting the video element of the podcast Otherwise, there's no point doing it. But once you've done that, then fundamentally, the audio-only version is the worst product. It immediately becomes interesting the, the inferior version. Or if it doesn't become the inferior version, then the, then the video is pointless, yeah. right? You're either adding video that you are not utilizing and is therefore not, not a real thing that you're making. It's just sort of superfluous stuff. Or you are engaging appropriately with video, you're engaging appropriately with what you're doing and really embracing that as a medium. And then the people who are not listening on Spotify, who are not watching it on YouTube, are getting the worst version. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, want, I, I don't want that to be the case. I don't yeah. want to either do video half-heartedly and so it's not a real thing. And I don't want to do video appropriately so that the audio is yeah there are some real. shows where you can immediately see the potential for adding video to them mm. and the different experience that that could provide where they're equally good i don't know how much else well, i think you either, the long you, you either go the whole way in or you don't do it and i think anywhere in between is a betrayal of someone somewhere <laughs> some part of your audience you are you are treating poorly and now going back to the the question i was going to ask before i, I sidetracked so so, uh, and, and I've had time to, to word the question better in my head. So if I, 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 if, I if Adam Hill's ever watching this, he's going to be weirded out now. If I wanted to make a Big Specs escape room or, or an escape room in general, how would I go about doing that? If I wanted to create it in an audio, for audio listeners, so if I was like on, for instance, I have my own college radio show. If I wanted to do an escape room, how would I go about creating that? All right. So that, yeah, this sounds like where I always start. You just get the idea. You have to go, okay, so what actual, what is your room that you want this to take part in? Would it be the Spicks and Specs studio? Would it be a live show version of it? What would this be? And actually try to get what room you are going to be in first. And so let's say that it was the standard Spicks and Specs stage studio, what it looks like. Then you have to come up with what is essential? What has to be there? And then what would be fun to be there? Yeah. And so you would go through, yeah, all of the things, all of the typical set pieces that you're expecting to see, all of the funny side things like the bicycle that you have to ride at a certain speed oh, to make bicycle. different sounds happen. You, you have to have things like that in there. They just feel like they're ripe for puzzles. So you just try to find all of the things that you know fit in that space that either just have to be there because you have no choice. Like if you're going to set something in a bedroom, it's pretty weird if you don't have a bed. Mm. Uh, and then you just try to find the fun objects that are in there. And at that point, people can vary in terms of how, what order they do things in. For me, I come up with, okay, what makes sense about this object? And what makes sense in terms of obstacles? Yeah. I like to have my goal in the room. What is your final goal? Has Adam Hills been kidnapped? Has he kidnapped you? What's going on here? <laughs> Adam Hills is a kidnapper. I, I, I couldn't imagine that, but that would be hilarious. <laughs> and so, yeah, then you've got to find out what is your eventual goal in the room? What's the story of this room? And then you can sort of find out once you know what your eventual goal is, you can find a place in the room that you are trying to 
get to? Like, is it just the front door is locked and you need to find the key for that door? Or is there something more to it? Is there something else you have to piece together about the room? And where is that going to happen? And, you know, like any who done it, they always say you can start from the end and work backwards. So once you know what your obstacles are, you can start to figure out what is in your way and where the puzzles fit in naturally. Wow. And and so with with um, ex- escape rooms being something that isn't like you just walk into a room and then have one in your head, how, how many hours does this take to create the idea and then actually try and generate it so you can visually see what you want to happen? just okay just the initial visualization part that tends to come in one big flood right at the start that's the easy part once I've got the idea I can draw out the room figure out what's in it occasionally a couple of times getting the narrative of the room gets me stuck for a couple of days but once that is in place once I know what the goal of the room is everything that is in the room that's there that just yeah that's a really nice fun quick part that's my favorite part And then I just write down everything that's in them. I draw arrows between things. And then I say, cool, this is going to unlock this. That's going to be locked. Oh, you'll probably find a code if you combine these two things. Um, I'll put a puzzle here. I don't know what it's going to be, but there's going to be a puzzle here. And figuring that part out is the hardest. And then, yeah, actually, I then have to follow that up with several days of typing everything because I'm a very poor improviser. So I need to get my script down pretty much word for word. And that's the hardest part for sure, because not just for myself, but because this is a very purposeful kind of writing that I am doing where I am having to try to get that image into other people's heads. I'm trying to direct their focus to the right clues and misdirect in the right sort of way so that it doesn't feel mean, but things feel hidden. And so, yeah, that the actual just straight up droning typing section, that's the one that takes yeah. a few days. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, for me, I'm going to be improvised. So I write things down and then forget what I've written down and just improvise and make it up on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so on my on my radio show at college, I I write a sitcom and then record it and have it, and then because I have to sort of like make up characters that are with me in the studio because these characters like are stuck in a absurd location, like in a sure. coffee shop. I then have to make up what they're gonna say and how they're gonna sound. I do that on the spot where oh. you can be listening to them talking and they'll have four different voices all in the same breath. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, we we have very different skill sets. That is definitely not something I can handle. Yeah, and, and it, it all just comes from a brain. So I've had I made a sitcom called The Amazing World of Terry and Simon that Paul Williams let me use one of his songs as the theme tune. Um, Aww. which 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 he hadn't even he didn't even know the concept of it yet. It was me with a um, hedgehog puppet that hadn't got a mouth, so it was like a sooty. If you know if you know what Sutty is, it's like a Sutty esque thing where Sutty just whispers to the ear and then I have to say well, oh. insane. And obviously I I haven't got the skills of hiding my arm. So it's like talking to me and you can see my elbow and then I have to talk to myself and I have to talk to that. And then I have to try and come up with scenarios where a frog has then appeared out of nowhere and stolen the camera and then I have to talk to a frog. Um, it's, it's, it's very weird and, and that's all I, I come up with the concept of what the episode's going to be and then it all just happens when I press record I don't know what's going to happen yeah our, our brains just have different connections going on in them I would panic at that there's also one of those things where like that kind of improvisation in an escape room immediately backfires because you'll say something as a silly joke and then half oh, yeah. an hour later someone's like look in my notes they, they said that that frog and the hedgehog, they were lovers. And so that's incredibly <laughs> important to this code. And you're like, no, that was a joke. No, 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 no. It's an incredibly important clue. And I've been focused on it the entire time. And now that means that it's not 731. How could it be? That would be it if they were estranged. They're, a, they're lovers. Oh. So the seven and the three go together. That makes an eight. Wow. Oh my God, what are you talking about? There are so many occasions where just in my notes, we've figured out in the play tests that there was just a throwaway sentence that was just meant to be haphazard room description or maybe a little joke or something that I wrote in for myself. I have to get rid of it because it sounds too important people are searching for clues wow. and so they will latch on to anything so you have to be very very specific hmm. with your language i think even if you 
were a phenomenal improviser, if you were a- It would still you know, be a big you risk. Would, you would have to sit and plan out everything mm. for the escape room because when it comes to the escape room, the language is the only thing people have to go on. So the language is the searching. It is the clues. It is everything, right? It's noticing you said cylindrical and then over here you said cylindrical. So maybe those two things are connected. So you have to be put the same level of care in every sentence that an escape room designer does when they buy a new prop and they go, oh, hold on a second here. There's like a weird pattern on the side of this antique, you know, armoire that I found. People are going to assume that's a puzzle. People are going to be upset and I have to fix that or change that or cover it. You know, people have talked about that going to escape rooms and saying we had a wooden floor and it had like knots in it and one of them looked like an arrow. And so yeah. people were following this arrow across our floor into the corner desperately searching for a clue yeah. and i've seen them be like no it's a knot in the wood it's in the grain like, it's in, the grain. It's not in a one of puzzle. in one of the early ones that we did there was a crow a, a resonance machine uh just a sciencey machine and i had spent a couple of years working in a lab i knew exactly what it was i knew how to use it it was not relevant to anything i really thought it was going to be important so i just clung to that thing yeah yeah and uh, and so you have to be careful language yeah is the same as the decoration of an escape room. And you, and if you've done escape rooms, you know how often you can look at a poster and be like, oh my God, this is the most important thing in the world. And it's not, and they try so hard to avoid that because it's not a fun experience. Whereas a lot of what comes from improv and a lot of the great stuff about improv is latching onto things like yeah. that from earlier and continuing it's, it and making it meaningful. You, it's deli it's the, the joy of it is giving importance mm. to things. And anyone who's run a D&D game will know this or you ah. know, a tabletop role-playing game. The most fun is when it's a throwaway character and then your players get obsessed with it. And then so they become, now it's then, this guy's long lost dad, exactly. I guess. And then like, you, know, you bring him back and it was like, whoa, it was that guy. And it's so, and by ascribing importance to those things that are improvised, that's where the joy is. But in an escape room, that's where the pain is. That's where you just, you cannot let them do that. You do not want, and we love it. People love doing it. And so you've got to be careful. <laughs> and, and so this is a sidetrack to what I was going to ask, but I'll ask my thing in a minute. But, uh, what what are your thoughts of like immersive um, escape rooms? So what I mean is that in the one I did, the Doctor Who one, you had the runner who was running the the escape room, and, and went, oh, I'm getting a phone call. Picks up his phone and and press answer, and then it's a voicemail, and it's a pre-recorded voicemail of Jodie Whittaker's Doctor saying, oh no, <laughs> we're going to be this, that, and the other, and it builds interpretation of oh, this is the mission, this is why what's going to happen in there makes sense, and this is why the Doctor Who references in there work really well. So so what's your thoughts on immersive? I would call it immersive, but mm. I don't know if there's an official term. I'm not into official terms, it must be. No, no, absolutely. Like, compare that to ones where it's just, just go into that room and solve puzzles until the door unlocks. We haven't done too many that are just at that sort of bare level. So the more story generally the better and you'll find that people who care about story tend to make sure that their rooms have a beautiful cohesive run to them and so they will naturally be better that way that being said I do physical escape rooms because I like puzzles if I went to escape rooms just because I liked stories there are plenty of ways that I can get stories and I love them in escape rooms but they're not the primary reason I do escape rooms so if there were none of that I would still totally do the room and be happy with the puzzles. Yeah. It just usually tends to be more of an indicator of the level of care and passion that the people have put mm -hmm. into it. Yeah. And yeah, for something that is as fan servicey as Doctor Who, for that, you want more story. That's going to make everyone happier. Yeah. And there's even like, there's layers of it. Like some people go very far into like designing websites that feel like you're part of the experience yeah. like that they are an extension of the escape room experience <laughs> there is some element where i start to feel exhausted and like i don't need it <laughs> so you want to be like oh but no have i actually bought tickets you've bought your tickets to the grand show the magician is delivering a grand performance and it will not be his first but it might be your last and you're like okay but but is it an escape room or is it a magic show mm. like, i want to be just clear mm, yeah. yes it's, and it's, so weird. You need to know sometimes what, yeah. the line is, is kind of fun exactly but i i would like some ability to just look at the game master and say cool this is still this is a game okay yeah, game I, I i hear about ones like the most amazing top rated rooms in europe where you meet them in a car park and you go through the things right from the beginning everyone is in character and everything and that makes me a little nervous yeah, i yeah. still i still like the 
the matter of no I'm me mm. I'm me playing a game you know what I mean in a car park and, and and a wizard a bank robber and um and just a random snake walk over and go you're all right the game's this way if you, if you want to follow me that 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 would just be incredible incredibly dodgy now now, before I get on to the incredible question I want to ask, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> it's going to be good. It, it's going to be good. Uh, so, where can people see, like, not not just listen, but if they want to play these escape rooms themselves, this is uh, the best way to promote um, and bush it. Uh, where where was the uh, which which part of the interwebs was the after uh, press to find all the escape rooms to them themselves? So. Uh... For, for, to listen, obviously, go to a go to a podcast player, search Escape This Podcast, you'll find all of our stuff or whatever app you're on. Uh, if you're listening along and you want to play the room that you are listening to, always check the show notes. There'll be a direct link to get all of the resources, the write-up, the the um, all the images that you might need if you do need any images. Uh, they're always linked in the show notes of every, every episode that we do. Uh, if you want to find a whole list of them, uh, we actually we have a, a website for all of our projects, which is called Consume This Media. Still in the theme. That can that escape this podcast, solve this murder. We have a Twitch channel called Play This Game. It's all under the Consume This Media umbrella. Yeah. If you go to the consumethismedia.com, uh, there's also a clear link to that main site from escapethispodcast.com. And the link there'll will be links be below. Because because uh, uh, it's an amazing website, and if you ever want to create your own escape room and you want to know how it's supposed to professionally look. Well, lo and behold, the description because it's like it's preferably like, the more recent ones. Yeah, the exactly. season one ones. Yeah, some of the some of the early ones. Are. But uh, but you can see there's a, the whole thing there in the escape this podcast section of all of the games that we've ever of, that we've made that you've written uh, and ones that we had guests write. And you can go to them and you can pick them. They're set so, uh, segmented by season. And any you just scroll through and you think that seems like a cool theme. You can click on it. And even without listening to us at all, you can download the notes play the game, run it for your friends. You run it like a, like a tabletop role-playing game. One person takes the game master role. They have all the information and they run the other players through the room. Um, and it's all free. It's all, you know, easily accessible and, and a great fun thing to do with friends. So now enemies. we come to the uh, link in the description for all that information and it will repeat at the end of the interview just in case you skipped right to the end because you didn't want to hear me with your own. Um, so Expectations are high now. Yes. Yeah, this is, is it. This is the big question. If this is the incredible question that that I might have hyped up that might have then fall flat on his face or its feet, depending on what time of animal it is. Uh, so you've wrote, so say if you've wrote a one hour um, escape room, how long is the recording time? Oh, that, yeah, that can be pretty variable, can't it? I reckon you usually add about 50% of the time. <laughs> to, I think just to the room itself. To the, I think for an, when the when the final episode is an hour long, then the recording, well, maybe not 50%, like the recording is usually an hour, 20, an hour, and a, sometimes an hour and a half, depends on the room. Sometimes you do a three hour recording and you can only cut it down to a two and a half hour uh, episode. You go, well, I guess it's just a long one. Um, but generally, right, like uh, we're making an escape room. We're getting, we're getting people to play it, but we also need to be aware that we're making... A, a show right and so there are times when people are playing where they're sitting there going uh oh wait hold on i just got confused over my notes wait have we done have we done this uh okay what well, i gotta write out the alphabet write it out again oh no i messed check. it up let's write the alphabet oh, wait, a couple more times right. let's try. and you're just like no one needs to hear that cut it all out we get 20 minutes of dead air turns into an immediate transition from wait a minute i gotta write out the alphabet oh i get it here's the code you're like, great yeah. you know we didn't need to Seems to go off on yeah, so we, we always tell our guests when they play, look, we tell our audience, and this is true, it is always a very honest final cut. You're never, whenever editing something down to change the fundamental way it went or to change, to make people seem smart when they weren't or to, or to make the answers better, or, or like it's always a very, you're getting the, a, a true representation of those players playing that room, making the same mistakes, making the same decisions. But we do also tell our guests that they're always going to sound smarter in the final edit because we get rid of dead air and repetitions and moments where they read something wrong and or it was our fault or, or, or they've decided completely to go off in the wrong direction. We have to bring it or we cut some tangents where we were talking about some other thing and we go, wait a minute, we're making a show. Let's go back to it. 
so it's very snappy it always we sort of edit the the pace down a little bit um but it's it is still a very true uh, kind of version of the experience just one that is more enjoyable to listen to yeah. than the raw recording would be. Yeah, quite frankly, the actual recordings of the rooms, I agree, maybe 50% more depending on the original mm. length of the room. Like if one actually managed to stick to one hour, then it probably was one of the easier ones mm. nowadays. So and, it probably wouldn't take much and longer. And to be honest, a lot of the stuff we cut is also unrelated to the room entirely. Oh it's yeah, when, we just go off on tangents. It's when we're in the middle and, and someone says, oh, this is like that episode of Taskmaster. And we go, yeah, right. And then we talk about Taskmaster for 20 minutes and go, oh, let's cut all that. That's uh, that's not relevant to the yeah. room. Yeah, the room itself is pretty snappy. All of the aside conversations that we take before, during and after, that's what <laughs> that needs editing down. Yeah. As, and, you've, as you've learned from this interview, we can talk for quite a while. Yeah, well, so can I. Um, some some people w- always ask me, do you, do you talk in your sleep? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm like, no, no do you, do you, are you a nuisance at home? Um, and, and then and then I reflect when I do it at home and then I realise I'm a nuisance to myself because my mum would walk in and go, um, who are you talking to? I went, I just talk to myself because I'm like yelling at something on the TV. It's like, <laughs> of course. Or, I, or, or they're about to do something that I don't really want to see it, but they're going to do it. I say, oh, get on with it. Um, and 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 so so if so from from that so if I uh, th- th- this is going off complete tangent that probably won't make it in the final edit. Depends on what words <laughs> I use. I have to be careful now. Uh, so if I had um made an escape room and, it, and I needed to keep it under an hour how would I go about making it a good escape room but still keeping it within an hour when you come to record it apparently I've gotten worse and worse at this <laughs> over time so perhaps I don't have any right to be answering this I think a big part of it is you you have to know the length of your room how long it should take and you need to know when to push right no one wants hints too early but if you're making media you know that you have to get to the end and so part of it is is thinking to yourself here's where we are now they haven't noticed this they haven't done this okay if they don't get it in the next minute or so we got to push ahead right so and that's when i can be like just a question did you ever thoroughly check that couch and they go no i never did oh my gosh and then they check the couch and they'll still feel like they thought of checking the couch. They'll still feel like, yeah, I did it. I remembered the couch and they didn't, but you, you, you tell them to, right? You say, oh, is there anything in the room that you mm, haven't looked at? Maybe something that you could sit on that you've forgotten about? <laughs> okay, hopefully not that egregious, um, but yeah. But but knowing when to push and knowing when to, to, to get people, like, you know when to let them go off on a tangent, when you, to let them sort of keep, coming up with random ideas and random solutions. And you should know when to be like, actually, they're not going to get there anymore. And I got to just nudge. I got to be like, you get faster at saying, no, that's not going to work. Surely that wouldn't work. I think the other things that you can do that make things feel a bit faster. I don't know how practical they are in terms of actually getting things faster, but obviously don't have too many puzzles. Like yep. that That's a pretty clear one. But of the different puzzle types that you can have, there are some that naturally take longer than others. So just limit those ones. Like this one that we just recorded quite recently that we knew was an, a ridiculously long one. It had big code translations. Hmm. They took a large amount of time of just sitting and having to process them. Whereas the other kind of puzzle that you can have a lot of is what's called, I don't know, colloquially, an aha puzzle. So that's just one where you stare at it and then, oh my God, it's right there. Okay, done. Mm. And as soon as you have seen it, you have solved it. And that's great because then you, you, there's no you, time, there's no tedium to it. And so like we, and for example, we, we just did two rooms very recently. One that we knew was going to be an episode of a podcast and yeah. one that we knew was going to be a live stream. Yeah. And the podcast episode had these process puzzles, ones where once you know what to do, you spend some time doing it. It had a few of them. Yeah. Because we knew that we can cut them down for time and we knew there was no time limit, right? We could have it to be as long as it wanted. We didn't then put those in the, no, the live, live show. had nothing like because that. It had nothing like that because uh, once you figure out what you should do, pretty much uh, you, you, uh, you are then done. The puzzle is finished once you figured out what you should be doing. Um, little bits of, of then applying that knowledge, right? Like, oh, it, this, these things are, sound like a code and we've got to try and make sure that it goes in that order. Read it to me again. Let me take notes this time. But generally everything is like a, you figure it out and then you move on. 
And that's easier to go quickly because you know it's not going to drag from someone figuring it out and then be like, all right, let's get going. Let's do this. <laughs> let's take some time. Um, so those knowing when you have a time limit, what types of puzzles mm. is, is a good, and, and just then you'll figure it out by play testing it as well, right? Get a few people to play it, see how long it takes them. If it's, they're consistently taking an hour, then you're probably fine. Maybe you then want to make sure that your play testers are probably consistently taking 50 minutes because if you're, they're if not you're trying be, to be rigid about it because yeah. if you're making a show as well you kind of want people to be a bit looser and jokier and and make and have some fun stories as you go or like make a funny comment so like you, you probably want people who are just sitting to play the room yeah. and not making the show to be doing yeah. it 45 or 50 minutes exactly yeah, there are all sorts of little adjustments that you can probably make. For instance, your final goal in the room. Some rooms have a lot more of a loose goal where you're not 100% sure where you're going to end up. But I would say that often if you're trying to be snappy, knowing what your goal is from the very beginning mm. can make it just feel quicker because the players can direct themselves to the things that they think are going to solve things faster. Yes. It might not even actually make a proper tangible difference, but it very much feels like it does. And the players are going to be more certain in their decisions. Yeah. And giving them a sense of urgency. Yeah. You can make people focus up in an escape room where there literally are no stakes. They're not in the room, but if you're just like, yeah, oh, they're someone's not even losing coming, money on this. They're going to get you. They're going to get you. Then they'll be like, okay, we got to go quick guys. Cause someone's coming to get us. Let's, yeah. oh, we know that the door's closed. Let's just go over the door, open the door. And then they'll find um, whereas, yeah, we run rooms and have played rooms where when you start, it's just like, welcome to the space. You are Ooh. going to investigate this and Ooh, see what happens, yeah. which works great. It's definitely a less yeah. urgent feeling. And you can feel that the pace from the beginning is very well. Oh, maybe let's look at this. Let's tell a joke. Let's uh, open this thing. Let's, And then you don't pick up the pace until the end of the room where now there's stakes and there's tension. We're like, oh, let's quickly, quickly, quickly do this. But the earlier you start that, the faster you can get through. Also, just the one other weird tip for that is there are always going to be some things in an escape room where you look at them and you can't do anything with them right from the beginning. What you want to make things feel faster at the start and get the ball rolling is to hope that the first thing that your players look at is something that they can actually do something with right away. And obviously you can't control them too much, but what you try to do is make one thing in the room, if you really want them to go to that first, make it seem the most urgent or the most weird so they feel like they have to go to that first. Yeah. Well, um, so so uh, to, to what, before we come on to the closing of the final few questions that I think will, will, will be a, a good place to saunter down to I'm, I'm thinking jazz music now uh of course I'll down to nice Alex so so the, the, the reason why I was asking that the, the really reason and I don't mind telling my viewers this uh, so so because because your podcast is amazing and because this interview <laughs> has also been amazing in, in, in the in the same sense because uh obviously a lot of things that people I end up interviewing I interview one because I like what they do, and two because at some point I've been inspired to do something because of their thing, and 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 because uh, on my radio show uh, at my college, uh, I just somehow have free reign to whatever I want, so I can play Vera Lynn or Doris Day or run a panel yeah. because 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 they like they like them what that runs it likes me, and and excellent, and I, and I can do whatever I like. It, it must seem, uh, and so I was. Um, think thinking during this to, to do I want to make this bits and specs escape room I want to do it now but um and so and so because um I haven't got long left before I finish for college because I finish on the 27th of May so, I, so I'm in the media <laughs> media world so um so doing so creating it so if I for instance if I started creating the escape room now would it would it would it be ready for for Thursday, if I if this is just theoretically, if I spent like a few hours working on it, or, or do you reckon like, or do you reckon it takes longer than a few days? For a first time doing one of these, I have heard anything from a few days to six months or so. Of We've definitely them. had someone bring one on. Oh yeah, they've done for, for two a couple years. years. So <laughs> that's going to totally depend on you. It's it a- absolutely can be done. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll advise uh, in our first season, we have a room that is set on a game show. Steal as much of that as you can. <laughs> yeah, it's a framework. You can take it. Right. Um, 
thank you is because I, my show is an hour and because I've finished ah. my uh, college project, I can probably um, blag the teacher's time because there's three, te- there's three teachers that teach scores and they always come in and out. So I could probably steal the teacher's time to make him do this escape room because the teacher nice. um, is an Adam Hills fan. Never seen Spicks and Specs, which I was very disappointed <laughs> to link to it straight away. But he, he has met and seen Adam Hills because he had, uh, he does photography. He was at some event and Adam Hills was there. So yeah. he had bumped into Adam Hills and Adam Hills did reject an interview with me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, me, me and Adam Hills have had some history. Uh, but yeah, now now we move down to the towards the end uh, to some of the questions that you wouldn't think you would want an answer to, but now you do want an answer to. So a lot of TV shows and other stuff have had board games. And I've never, I, I'm not in the world of board games enough to know if there's any, any escape room board games, but would the podcast ever be an interesting idea to turn into a board game called Escape This Board Game? So it's basically the podcast and it's like Monopoly type of thing. So the characters you're playing are the guests that have been on your podcast. Would that be a <laughs> concept that would work? Uh, there definitely Ooh. are escape room podcasts. Uh, board escape games. room board games. <laughs> There's definitely an escape room podcast. It's us. Um, <laughs> there are definitely escape room board games. Uh, and they work in a whole variety of different sort of ways. Um, there are ones that sort of, they're, they're like little card-based ones from the Unlock series. There's, uh, what is Escape? Is Escape card-based as well? Oh my God, I, I'm worried. I, I, I don't want to say anything definite. I'm worried that I'm going to mix things up uh, brand there's by some, brand. There are some great ones. There are some, there are some ones that are not quite there's, escape rooms. They're the ones that are booklet-based. Yes, they're little book. Yes, that's right. They're kind of booklets and going through. Um, there are some great puzzly games that are quite close to escape rooms but aren't explicitly escape rooms. Um, Neil Patrick Harris has a game called Box One, which is a f- phenomenal escape room adjacent uh, board game, at home game, fantastic. We, we have friends and are very big fans of the work of the people who made the first escape room in a box. Yes, Wild Optimists make, uh, where, I can never remember the title. The Werewolf room, Experiment. It was the Werewolf Experiment. And I could never remember then... where they go, escape room in a box. It's escape yep. room in a box and they, they're fantastic. I think if you were trying to replicate the feeling of ours in an Oh, es- you have ideas? I've, I've, I've never thought about this. I'm thinking Ooh, about okay. it right now. I think because what is so fundamental to, I think, the flavour of our show uh, is your narrative writing. It's the fact that you are a, 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 an author as much as you are a puzzle designer. Which is right? hilarious since I do escape rooms more for the puzzles and the stories. But, but you make them with such, good, or with such good narrative and audio. I think you would need to have something where there's a lot of pre-written like things on cards almost i could imagine you could literally have like a map as a board and place the the you know you you draw instead of having a a picture of a table on the on the board you have a card where the back of it is a table you put that face down and when people want to search the table they pick it up and they flip it over and it's a description of what's going on and this is now oh now i almost want you to cut this just bleep it all out this is tm tm we could we could make this um (laughs) it's feeling a little bit uh betrayal betrayal house on the hill like betrayal where you flip a new tile except when you get to the tile you you tie it directly into narrative you could Mm. have narrative you could even you could even have like cards layered so the first card is the basic description the second one is the is like a more thorough investigation or intriguing like, but you, then then i don't know how you would then oh, you'd have to come up with things, gating. Right? how do you gate things because that is difficult that's thing. a very hard part when it comes gating to in board games is incredibly difficult yeah so trying to come up with ways to stop people just opening everything looking at everything yeah, yeah why don't they just flip to the answer section what is it about and how do you make it easy and obvious right so if we just had the next pro- appropriate step on another card People might accidentally flip it up and not know that they shouldn't have yet. Mm. How do they know? And not even it's not even about stopping people cheating. People can cheat at any board game, right? You can just grab a handful of houses in Monopoly and throw them wherever you want. It's making sure people know definitely when they are, have achieved that next step, that they know now they can flip this. Yeah, so That's it, the, hard the same way that it comes to me doing room design, coming up with what the room looks like, what's in it and what the goal is, that can be easy. Coming up with the obstacles is the next step. Mm. And yeah, for a board game, that's something that you might have board to take some time to think because about. Because you can't, because anytime yeah. someone tries to do something in the podcast, Danny can say, no, don't do that. That's wrong. 
but a board game can't say no. It can only imply no and yeah. hope that you've noticed. And some of the others that are out there, they use really interesting systems like numbered cards where oh, you have right. to find the right numbered card for the solution that you're after. Some of them use like, what do you call them? Decoder sorts of devices. So yeah. you have to put in the right symbols yeah. and then match them up to a thing. And that tells and you so if you got answers right. so they can take right. inputs from a few wow. places to get a single code. There's some really really smart stuff that people are doing to to solve the how do you gate a board game yeah. escape room a lot of people have solved it um we would have to solve it in a different way i think yeah. to make it feel like our show yeah well um to because because we were because you were struggling to come up with brand names i googled it on a side note to find the answer and i i don't know what i've stumbled across but I, i'll explain it because it's it's easier without if I don't share my screen because it's a nightmare in the morning, it's part yeah. of the book. It's called Escape Room, the game. So ah. it, it's like a box. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's like a box, like that, that big. And, and it has and it has a timer. So the website is just built to, it has a timer on it to have how long you've got until you do it. And you, and you get a pack with a different inf piece of information on it. Uh, and it. And it just seems really, really interesting because you have to identify... It is, and it says the tagline is uh, the ultimate escape room experience at home. Yeah. So there are a few of them out there right yeah. now. And yeah, everyone has different ones that they prefer because they do all approach it in impressively different ways, considering mm, you wouldn't yeah. think that there were that many different ways to get through this. Yeah. I, th I think one of the things that was really interesting about escape room in a box that was one of the very kind of first versions of it is they embraced having like actual props and puzzles mm. there are that is not just cards or information they have things that you can do and it feels like when you're in an escape room you've got the objects and you're trying and to course. put them in the right places and align things and they, that's the element they have that a lot of other ones don't whereas unlock has a big technological uh, element to has it the, as well but also yeah. the way they use their cards mm. they have a, a really nice way of emulating searching and f like they will because they have numbered cards that you have to get to but sometimes you'll like see like go wait a minute like, you're hold looking this at card the up. artwork on like, one of the cards the artwork on like on this mirror there's a little 31 in the corner does that mean that's card 31 and it's kind of hit it's literally hidden to from you search wise but if you see that little 31 you find card 31 and you're like yeah you found this secret mirror card and this has another puzzle that opens this gives you a hint to this other and like they've managed to really emulate searching and also like traveling journeying from what because mm. they have cards that have different locations and, and yeah. that's a really smart way to do it so people are uh, emulating feelings of escape rooms in lots of different ways and of course that's not even to say the ones where they're embracing the think outside the box ones by doing things like incorporating props that you didn't realize were part of the game like yes. the rule book there are puzzles hidden in the rule book. Yes. The lid of the box. That's a puzzle. Yeah, that's and all sorts really of things. Really interesting yeah. ways people are trying amazing to. Amazing And again, it's because people are trying yeah. to not think, how can I make this the most like a normal escape room? But how can I make the most out of it, an at-home boxed escape room experience? How, what, what do I need to change and play with for this new medium that I'm trying to explore with escape rooms and puzzles? Um, and the more earnestly and intelligently they think about that and really embrace what they're doing with that medium, the better it is. It's always, it's, it just creates the, the best experience. You don't want it to be, hey, this is a bad simulacrum of a real escape room, mm. right? You want it to be a perfect version of a boxed escape room. Yeah, and now we're gonna lead into the final question because this question, when I wrote it, uh, didn't make sense but now it does make sense now <laughs> over the over the course of this interview we have learned that that uh, escape rooms didn't start from when you were a, a small child and, and and we've learned so much about you two and the viewers know more about you now than they did previously and they, and, and now when you look back at your childhood uh, <laughs> was there any tv shows or anything that that now when you think about it sort of was what made you get into this area because it's like a, a niche area to get into but the, the norm, normal when you think about it is something it, when you were a child that sort of started it but you didn't realize until later on in life 
I have very much been going back and looking at things in my childhood. Look, I was always, I was a nerdy kid. I was very much, I went to trivia nights with my parents and things like that. I would write my own tests and things like that and say, oh, this is Danny's IQ test. And it was very clear that this was going to be something I was into, but I have noticed it more and more, like going to my parents' house, searching through a bookshelf of my old books. I just found one recently from when I was, I don't know, 12 years old and I found it and it is just puzzles of all kinds. It has memory tests, it has number patterns, it has all the mazes and spot the differences and simple things like that. It had every kind of puzzle. And I just blasted through that thing as a child. And I just go, I didn't remember this book existed. I didn't remember that I was so into this. Apparently this has always been a thing that I've been into more than I even remembered. Whereas for me, I don't think I really was into puzzles as a kid. I never really, I don't think I, I don't think I properly got into puzzles until my mid twenties when we like, you know, like, wow. but I think the thing for me that really transitions into escape rooms and what we're doing now from a young age is adventure games. That's true. On computer, like old Sierra event, like playing, uh, uh, playing like uh, Grim Fandango, right? Classic LucasArts games like Monkey Island and things like that. Um, I, I mean, I played Grim Fandango over and over again when it came out. I played uh, Hero Quest and, and all those other kind of Sierra adventure games and point and click things. We were recently replaying one that I played as a kid, um, Flight of the Amazon Queen, mm. and a whole bunch of these old where it is just figure out how to solve this puzzle in a, in a space, walk through this world. Talk, they have narrative. They, to me, really transition into this. I, I used to do text-based adventure games. I think things every like that. sort of early computer game, I, I don't know about you, I didn't play computer games at home very often. So it was all the ones at school, the educational games mm -hmm. that we played at school. And the more <laughs> I look back at them, the more they were exactly this sort of thing. Mm, they have the same thing. And also... Choose your own adventure books, oh. especially like the fantasy flight games where you're where they have a bit more game. They're a bit, they're kind of a mix somewhere between choose your own adventure and D and D, right? Where they were like, oh, you're exploring the wizard's tower, but also your character could die in a fight with a goblin. I love the fantasy yeah. flight games. Mine were the give yourself goosebumps. Give yourself goosebumps. R.L. Stein, I think I, I've been reading him since I was what six years old or something, and I'm still not stopping. I think that he is a huge part of where I am now mm. uh but yeah all those sorts of things they they, they adventure mm. trying to place yourself into that situation and use your brain to I've get out also also yeah I, things like Agatha Christie's even going back earlier to famous five books mysteries oh. and being able mm. to try to solve things to get to the end a hugely important part we have a book series in Australia by Emily Rodder called Del Toro Quest oh, and yeah. Yeah, they are just about a couple of kids in the fantasy world and there are puzzles and riddles all through the books that these characters have to solve to defeat the evil Shadow Lord. And yeah, it's just all there. It's fantastic. It just all really, it, it's all in so many things that I went to and I never found all of these connections until you start looking for them right now. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, Doctor Who, well, for me, Doctor Who, they released two Choose Your Own Adventure books where they're like, Go to page two hundred and sixty-five to find out what happens next, and you and you do it, and, and that and that's incredible. Now, now we come to the end of the interview. Before we get into a very interesting thing that might make a deleted scene or might make the end of this, and then how well it goes. But I am, I, I'm laughing on the inside. So, uh, for viewers that might not remember, would you be able to replug where they can listen to the podcast? where they can find the website, where they can find anything they want to about you to watch you climb from where you were for this interview and where your fame is going to rise, <laughs> yes. rise and rise. Yeah, because Ryan Reynolds is watching right now and yeah. he's, he's getting yeah. ready to plug it on Twitter. So is Ian McKellen. We're going to be the official podcast of Rex. If Ian McKellen is into escape rooms, please let us know. Oh, yeah, let's get or, Ian on. Or I'll give you an even better name. Her Majesty the Queen interesting Queen Elizabeth. She, she gives good energy i reckon she'd be into it what is australia but england but the british royal family's escape room <laughs> so, uh, uh, so uh to find what we're doing sorry everybody hi uh to find us uh if you're on a podcast app anywhere search escape this podcast give it a listen if you like puzzles or escape rooms or adventures or tabletop role-playing 
that's where to go. Escape this podcast. If you want to find everything that we do, you can head to consumethismedia.com. You'll find all the links for Escape This Podcast, all the links for the various escape rooms we've made. If you don't want to listen to us, but you want to play our games, you can find the links to all the write-ups there. We've done a couple of commissions for like the Sydney Opera House and things like that. So they're just online puzzles. So yes. you don't have to listen to any of us Yeah, talk. there should be links on Consume This Media, but you can check out uh, in-browser games for the Sydney Opera House. Um, we've done two of those. Uh, so check those out. Uh, it's all there. Solve This Murder is there. A whole bunch of fun stuff. Uh, and go go and listen. And then tell your friends to listen. And then they'll tell their friends. And then you tell more friends. Someone's friends with Ryan everybody. Reynolds and Ian McKellen and the Queen somewhere. Yeah, um, that, that's really funny, that, because uh, Graham, on the Graham Norton show, Reynolds Master Thayer was on it, and they did a big red chair, and a New Zealander had come on it. And then she went, do, do I know you? And then they realised that she had a friend of a friend. Of course. Her friend. So it, it could happen. Ian McKellen. Every could, time. Well, he could be having a break from starring in a in an in a in a uh, action film. So, I'll, what you'll see in the description is the website because it say it saves too many words. Yeah. You only have to press one yeah. button. Put the website. Put the website. Just go there. It'll be great. Yeah. Now, um, uh, hello. If you're watching this on the deleted scene or or uh, enjoying this, like, but so for for context. So on. Tom's Comedy Club, we have a panel show called Tom's No More Jockeys. Basically, Alex on the panel show. Alex oh. knows about it, and Alex always shared it with his friends. So, nice. So, yeah, and, and, and my twist was to, at random points, I would say the name of the contestant, and then we would, then they would start singing the song I told him to sing, uh, because obviously I don't want to cause, cause any uh, uh, upset for Alex, so I changed it a little bit. So I thought... Just, just because, um, it, just because, why not? For us three to try and attempt to sing the uh, round the twist theme tune, just because it's a good theme tune, and if anyone oh might, it might recognise the theme tune more than the program itself, and it might help them. Technically. Goodness, right? you sing round the twist. Oh, that's tough. Do you have? Do you have to do the um, round? Of course you do. Yeah, you gotta do that. Twist. <laughs> what was that? Exactly. Right. Is you going to sing? So it was all singing it at once because it's all of us at once. That's me. It's going to be fun. So I, all right. On my, on my account, ready? Three. Hope we know where it starts. I don't, well, we'll all just pick up at some point. It might be disaster. <laughs> Who knows? Right, ready? So it's are three. we going to start with the weirdness or no, with the. We're just have going straight you? in. Straight okay. in. Straight we're right. just going straight in or else we'll okay. be here all day. Ready? Okay. Three, yep. two, one, go. Have you, have you ever, ever, ever felt, felt like, like this? this? Where strange, strange things happen. happen. Are you, you going, going round, round the twist? twist? Oh, have you heard the word about the bird and the spider that wriggled and wriggled and jiggled inside the of us on the river? Have you ever felt like this? Where strange things happen. Are you going round the twist? Going round the twist. I believe it's how it ends. There we go. And um, yeah, that's how you end an interview. <laughs>